Thanks, Alice. Today I'm going to go over lifecycle environments and content views in Red Hat Satellite 6. In addition, I'll talk about compliance in Red Hat Ansible Tower. Using these tools will allow you to build a secure baseline for your environment. We're going to go ahead and log into the Red Hat Satellite server. We'll go to Content, Lifecycle Environments. The lifecycle environment defines how systems appear at a certain point in time. For example, an email server might only require a simple application lifecycle where you have a production level server for real world use and a test server for trying out the latest mail server packages. Once the test server passes the initial phase, we can set the production level server to use the new packages. Another example might be in a development lifecycle for a software product. You might aim to develop a new piece of software in a development environment, have it tested in a QA environment, pre-release it as a beta, then release it as a production level application. Each application lifecycle uses a set of stages called environments. Library, which contains everything that was run from the previous sync from Red Hat. In this case, dev, QA, and prod. You can define these lifecycle environments that fit around your business process and the grouping of your servers. Each environment acts as a particular state for our systems. Each environment also follows on from a previous environment, creating a chain of environments that becomes our application life cycle. So let's now talk about content views. Red Hat Satellite 6 uses content views to create customized repositories from the core repositories library. It achieves this through defining which repositories to use and then applying certain filters to the content. These filters include both package filters, package group filters, and errata filters. We use this content views as a method to define which software versions for a particular environment to use. A production environment might use a content view containing older package versions, while a development environment might use a content view containing newer package versions. At its core, a content view is a collection of repositories that are on the same lifecycle. From a di design perspective, you generally keep repos which have dependencies on each other grouped together. For example, RHEL 7 Server, RHEL 7 Server Optional, and Satellite Tools should almost always be on the same content view. Each content view creates a set of repositories across each environment, which the Satellite Server stores and manages. When we promote a content view from one environment to the next environment in the application lifecycle, the respective repository on the satellite server updates and publishes the packages. So let's look at some content views. RHEL 7 all errata base. This content view contains right now two repositories, Red Hat Satellite Tool 6.2 for RHEL 7 server and Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 server RPMs. Let's add a repository to this content view. Let's add the optional repository. We click the Add Repositories button and it has now been added. In addition, you can see the number of packages that are applied and the number of errata that each repository contains. From here, we also have filters. This content view has a couple filters. This includes all errata until June 1, 2017 and it also includes all packages without errata. Another content view here has an exclusion under its filters. This once again includes all errata until June 1, 2017, all packages without errata, but this also does not include Emacs. This can be used to exclude packages that you do not want into your environment for a more secure minimal baseline. In this case, I've already started a publishing of a new version. This is taking it and putting it in the library lifecycle environment. As you can see, it contains 14,521 packages, 1,958 errata, and those are broken down into various categories such as bug fixes, enhancements, and security. 
I have another content view over here that is, is in multiple lifecycle environments, including library and prod. We can click on a specific version and drill down into what is in this content view. In this case, we can do packages. This will show all packages that are part of this content view, including their version, their release, and what architecture they apply to. We can also click on errata to see what errata, based upon the errata ID, the title, what type, how many content hosts are currently affected, and when was it updated. So this is Satellite's way of allowing you to select what immutable content to provide to your systems. Basically, they are version bundles of repositories with optional filters applied to control content flow. So now let's talk about SCAP. The securities policy is a crucial part of your overall compliance solution. While the choice of tools depends on how your big your infrastructure is, choice of policy mainly depends on what your infrastructure is used for. If you are working with the U.S. government, you most likely need to comply with USCGB. If you're a payment processor, you need to be PCI DSS compliant instead. The SCAP standards enables you to mix and match tools and content. At first glance, this just provides additional complexity, but the separation of tools and content provides a lot of additional flexibility and lowers the risk of vendor lock-in. You are free to use security policies provided by one vendor and tools to implement this policy from another, which I'll show you later by applying the NIST 853 controls to a host in Ansible Tower. The core of SCAP security policies are the rules and titles description. These come from so-called prose guides, text documents that describe the security policies in a human readable form. However, the most valuable part of an SCAP security policy is the code for automated evaluation of each rule. This code is what allows auditors to evaluate compliance without tedious manual checking. In this case, we have the Guide for Secure Configuration of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7. Going through the table of contents, let's pick a random control. Restrict root logins. Direct root logins should not be allowed for emergency use, only for emergency use. In normal situations, the administrator should access the system via a unique unprivileged account and then use su or sudo to execute privilege commands. Discouraging administrators from accessing the root account directly ensures an audit trail in organizations with multiple administrators. Locking down the channels through which root cannot connect directly also reduces opportunities for password guessing against the root account. The login program uses the file slash etsy slash secure tty to determine which interfaces should allow root login. The virtual devices slash dev slash console and slash dev tty star represent the system consoles accessible via control alt f1 through control alt f6 keyboard sequences on a default installation. The default security file also contains slash dev slash vc slash star. These are likely to be deprecated in most environments but may be retained for compatibility. Root should also be prohibited from connecting via network protocols. Other sections of this document include guidance for describing how to prevent root from logging in via SSH. SCAP content is a data stream format containing the configuration and security baseline against which hosts are checked. Checklists are described in the extensible checklist configuration descriptive format XCDDF, and vulnerabilities are in the open vulnerability and assessment language OVAL. This is basically a less human readable format of what we just read here from the guide, in this case, restrict root logins. Checklist items 
also known as rules, express the desired configuration of a system item. For example, you may specify that no one can log into a host over SSH using a root user account. Rules can be grouped into one or more profiles, allowing multiple profiles to share a rule. SCAP content consists of both rules and profiles. You can either create an SCAP content or obtain it from a vendor. A number of supported profiles are provided for Red Hat Enterprise Linux in the SCAP Security Guide package. Take a look at the Red Hat Enterprise Linux Security Guide for more information on how to download, deploy, tailor, and define your own content using the SCAP Workbench. If you installed the SCAP components of Red Hat Satellite 6 on Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, The default SCAP content will be installed for both Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 and Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7. The XCCDF profile is a checklist against which a host or host group is evaluated. Profiles are generally created to verify compliance with a standard, whether that be an industry standard or a custom standard. To list all available profiles, open the satellite UI and navigate to host policies. In this case, we are going to create a new compliance policy. A compliance policy is an application of specific SCAP content and XCCDF profile to one or more host groups on a set schedule. The schedule on which a scan is run is specified by the satellite server, but the scan itself occurs on a host. When the scan is complete, an asset reporting file, an ARF, is output in XML format and uploaded to the satellite server. You can see the scans, the results of the scan in the compliancy policy dashboard. So let's go ahead and create one. We'll name this one Rail 7 Test Policy we will go ahead and click next from here we select the SCAP content and the XCCDF profile that we want to use in this case let's use the United States government configuration baseline next let's choose a schedule we can choose weekly monthly monthly or custom if we choose custom it will be in a cr custom cron line format. In this case, let's choose weekly and every Tuesday. From there, we select the locations that we want this scan to run on. In this case, we will make it available in both locations. We will also select the default organization, in this case Red Hat, to run on. From here, we will select the host groups in which we want to run this on. In this case, we will select all of them. After we click the Submit button, when the Puppet agent runs on the host, which belong to the selected host group or host to a which a policy has been applied, the Open SCAP client will be, install will be installed and a cron job added when the policy's specific schedule is run. So if we click on a policy name, in this case, we can view the comp policy compliance dashboard. You will get a ring chart which illustrates a high level view of a host compliance with the policy, a statistical breakdown of host compliance with the policy in tabular format, and a link to the policy's latest reports. So in this case, one host has been have a report. As you can see here, it breaks it up by severity, the message, the resource in which it came from, and the result of the scan. Let's select a high. In this case, it gives you the description of what it is checking for, the rationale as to why, and then it includes several references which are linked as to where this policy comes from. 
You also have the ability to view the reports page, which gives you a list of all of your hosts, when they were last reported, and a quick overview of if it's passed, failed, or other. So now that we have looked at creating and reporting on building a secure baseline in Red Hat Satellite 6, let's look at compliance using Red Hat Ansible Tower. In this example, I'm going to apply a playbook that applies the NIST 853 to a host, in addition to actually applying the policy we can use Ansible Tower for reporting. What is the NIST 853? It is a publication that recommends security controls for federal information systems and organizations and documents security controls for all federal information systems. The NIST 853 is published by the National Institutes of Standard and Technology, which creates and promotes the standards used by federal agencies to implement the Federal Information Security Management Act, also known as FISMA. It also manages other programs designed to protect information and promote information security. Agencies are expected to meet NIST guidelines and standards within one year of publication. The NIST 853 subdivides security controls into common, custom, and hybrid categories. Common controls are those often used throughout an organization. Custom controls are those intended to be used by an individual application or device. Hybrid controls start with a standard control and are customized per the requirements of a particular device or application. A key part of the certification and accreditation process for federal information systems is selecting and implementing a subset of controls or safeguards from the security control catalog. These controls are the management operational and technical safeguards or countermeasures prescribed for an information system to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the system and its information. After Red Hat Satellite provisions a host, let's use Ansible to secure it. In this playbook, we are applying the controls specified by the NIST 853 policy. In addition, we are calling the STIG rel SCAP profile that we demoed earlier. In this case, as we go through, you can see what it is doing and applying. In this case, verifying the correct file permissions with an RPM. We are ensuring that the Red Hat GPG key is installed. Ensure that GPG check is enabled in the manium configuration. This goes on. Having a playbook not only applies the policy, but due to Ansible's immutable nature, you can safely run a playbook again to verify that a host is compliant with a specific requirement. So in this case, we can see that this changed when installing the Red Hat GPG key. But this came back as OK to ensure that the GPG check for enabled in mainium configuration was enabled. Since Ansible playbooks are immutable, if I ran this playbook again, this would come back as OK because it's already been previously done. So when you run a playbook multiple times, it does not keep applying it. It will first check to make sure that the policy is compliant. This allows you to run the report and provide it to your security officer without actually making changes against a specific host. So with that, my friends, we end the demo portion and I'll return you to the Amazing Alice to wrap up our webinar before the QA portion. Thank you.